We're here at DevOps UK and I'm with Patrick. So Patrick, um, I'm a geek, I want to lead a team. Top three tips. Yeah, um, so A, it's really good that you want to lead a team. Um, what I would say top three tips are um, you can't really approach the role like you would as a developer. So as a developer, you're probably um, wanting to solve all the problems, but actually as a sort of lead, you actually have to move to a different mode. So yeah. I kind of talk about move from maker to multiplier mode. Okay. Uh, so that's tip number one. Oh, what does that mean? Uh, so it kind of means that in maker mode, you're kind of solving problems yourself in that yeah. you want to actually make the decisions, choose the technology, talk about the approach. And actually that can often be one of the worst things to do as a lead. Benevolent dictator. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, part That's of it. That's my favorite role. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it depends on how dictator you play versus how much benevolence there is. That's true. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think it's very tempting or easy to fall into that trap of making all the choices because it's kind of what you're used to. Yeah. Um, but actually, that kind of takes away a lot of um, the sense of empowerment from a lot of developers and also builds up a bit of resentment as well. So. So that balance between that benevolent dictator versus just being a dictator and being a nice dictator. <laughs> oh, okay, so um, so what does multiplier mean? Yeah, so the multiplier is really about this thing about um, your focus changes from actually doing things to enabling other people to do things more effectively. Okay, so, so less personal code, more... Yeah, so it's really thinking about what efforts you can do to actually improve the development team. So rather than programming yourself, it's more thinking about how you program through the people on your team. And that often means to be a better developer, it's not really about developing your own skills only, but actually helping other people develop their skills and make sure that there's knowledge spread across the team. Okay, so for example, I might focus and go, I uh, wonder how Lauren's doing. Yep. Uh, has she got the tools that she needs? Yep. Do we as a team have the tools that we need? Exactly, yeah. And it's trying to, yeah, exactly try to identify the gaps of both the tools and also probably knowledge as well. So as teams are sort of working on different sort of features, um, new areas, you'll probably have one person that starts to understand how that is solved in one area. So you get a specialism and knowledge. But obviously that's a risk if that person goes away. Yeah. And also it prevents other people from contributing. So it's then thinking about how you uh, I guess spread that knowledge within the team and encourage that. Cool. So tip one is, I suppose then, in it, to summarize, it's, it's letting go of your own desire to control the team. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and become a facilitator. That's right, yeah. So, I mean, it probably depends on the team as well, because I think if you're the most experienced person on the team, and um, if you're maybe with a whole bunch of people who are really inexperienced, mm. you might need to be making a lot of those decisions. Is it then maybe better to switch to something like pair programming and go more into a teacher mode? Yeah, that can definitely help. So I think, um, once again, it really depends on the team. So uh, and it, as an example, if I was leading a team of just all university graduates, mm. obviously you can't really rely on people's experience because they haven't got any yet. Yeah. But people are really enthusiastic. And so actually a more explicit teacher mode is really useful because they're really willing to learn. But if you're working with a bit more of an experienced team, you probably come, come across as maybe... Um, uh, I don't know. Um, to be as, more gentle in your approach. Yeah, exactly. So you have to let people maybe contribute their own ideas and their experience and then maybe fill in gaps where you see it or, yeah. So what do you do then if you're in that role and you say, what do you all think? And someone suggests something, but you know it's a bad idea. Yeah, I guess um, sometimes people have to fail for the... So they don't learn unless they get to fail as well, right? So I think it's really about can you help people find things that don't work for themselves to allow them to learn on their own journey but not have a negative impact overall? So I think, for instance, you know, if, if you're going to lose like an hour or an afternoon and actually if that helps that person understand why the other solution might be a better choice, that might be a good thing because people have to go through those processes of understanding sometimes pain to avoid some situation versus just simply follow somebody's sort of recommendation. So maybe you could do, I'm going to forget the agile term now, uh, it's not called a sprint. Spike? <laughs> spike, yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe you could do a spike. Then. Exactly, yeah. So it might be yeah, just a short time box thing that allows people to explore different things and then you can actually make a better um, informed decision. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so what's tip two? So tip two would be actually finding a way to actually still maintain some uh, technical hands-on experience. So this okay. is really about that balance between you can flip too much the other way where you're not, you know, you're enabling people so much that you're not actually understanding what's going on in the code base. I have a friend where I used to work um, who's found, now he's, he's in like a principal, and it's semi-principal engineer role, 
He's now not engineering at all. Yep. When he sits down to work, he's interrupted. Yeah. So how do you protect yourself then from going completely the other way into management? Yeah, I guess it depends on the role because the principal engineer might not have the responsibility of leading a team and technical architecture. They might as well, depending on the situation. But for people who are actually leading a team in a technical architecture, mm. there's that trying to really find that time balance and there's no real perfect way of doing it. Um, I know tech leads, for instance, who really block out days yeah. where it's really, you know, I'm in maker mode and they push all the meetings other sort of days. Other people can kind of flex with it because they kind of understand. Um, sometimes it's really just about a almost visual signal yeah. um, to let people know, you know, like I'm working sort of development mode. Uh, Stuck on the screen or... <laughs> exactly, yeah, or a flag or something yeah. on the table to, to indicate. But there's different ways of doing it. Okay, so you need to set, set a boundaries. Yeah, exactly. So it's really just about finding the time and then everyone has their own personal style of, of finding ways of doing that. Um, so I kind of talked before about also how tech leads might end up sort of doing a bit more going through Git commit logs and understanding what's going on as another way of sort of staying in touch with the code base and still staying technical or maybe a bit more pragmatic pair programming uh, where they're not, na not really chained to the desk with somebody, yeah. but they're a bit more in between their meetings coming back and sort of resuming where they picked up, um, but they'd already discussed how they were going to break up the problem so there's no surprises and yeah. Um, so one thing I found is that the, the more years I have in tech, the actually, funnily enough, the more time I spend in my own time keeping skilled up. Yep. Do you think when you're moving into one of these roles where you're losing a bit of the technical side and you're kind of more focusing on enabling other people, yep. do you personally find that you spend more time at home on the weekends reading up and things? How do you find that balance where you, you stay technically involved, but you're not sacrificing your personal life to, to, to stay caught up? So I know a lot of people who have this anxiety, I've worked really hard technically, yep. I've now got a tech lead position or something like that, and I'm not doing as much tech, how yep. do I keep up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a really tough kind of thing, and I think even developers struggle with that because yeah. even there's always new things to go out there with. Um, I guess there's a couple of things that I try to keep in mind. So one is uh, really focus on sort of the principles that outlast tools. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the idea is a continuous delivery. It doesn't really matter what programming platform or which tools or say CI, CD type things or infrastructure automation you use, but yeah. um, those principles transcend some of those things. So I really try to focus on those things first, yeah. but then also make sure that I find time um, with the team that I'm working with to be a bit more hands-on. So it might be about spikes or um, trying to make explicit time that it's valuable for you to be on, hands-on yeah. to make better informed decisions. Um, and a lot of that just comes down to expectation management, which is really hard, but is a skill that you kind of need to develop as part of this role. What's your third tip? Uh, so I think the third tip for me was maybe related to this one, which is actually about making time for yourself. Yeah. So um, I think one of the challenges, which is this transition from being a developer to a tech lead, is that you kind of feel kind of lonely. So as a developer, you have teams of developers around you or people, and you can kind of, you know, balance ideas about technical problems you have, but when you're actually dealing with maybe things that affect the whole team, you certainly don't have anyone to do that with. Like, yeah. you, you kind of can, but then it might feel a bit weird because you might be talking about particular people on your team or particular challenges, and you need somebody that's maybe a bit more removed. So I actually think it's important to find time to reflect, but also maybe somebody outside of the team. They can kind of bounce ideas off. And is that important as well from a social point of view? Because if you say you, you progress the ranks through the ranks in a team, yep. your social status changes. Yeah, absolutely. You, you might struggle with friendships that you once yes. had on equal terms. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's, that's completely that, which is like the relationships of the people will change regardless of just because you have a different role and that has different responsibilities and accountability and to a certain degree power and authority from an organization. Uh, because there are expectations of things you're supposed to do that aren't expected of a developer. So your relationships will change and I think you do kind of need um, a safe space for you to be able to sort of maybe talk about the problems that you're having. Have a moan. Have a moan. <laughs> yeah, talk about how you might deal with it. Yeah, bit of a cry. Yeah, yeah sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I suppose it's always good if you don't have someone in your organization to start maybe going to meetup groups and find someone independent as well. Absolutely, yeah. So. Um, when I work with organizations and teams, I try to encourage people maybe in similar roles in that group, if your company's big enough, to get together yeah. and to talk about those topics because there's probably things that actually are affecting all teams that maybe there's a system problem in the organization or process that makes sense to change. Yeah. But it's also healthy just to get completely different you know, 
friends who are in that same role or just external people because a you know you get to moan and yeah. nobody's going to complain but also you get a more independent perspective of you know somebody's ideas about what's not coupled to your team or interests Work it, make it, do it, makes us